Terry, pleasure to meet you. How are you? Pretty good. <laughs> I think they leave the bikes down there. So. All right. Terry, you've had a, a wonderful career in film and television. At what point did you find yourself getting the acting bug? <laughs> That's a good way to start, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm a, uh, a graduate industrial engineer, mm -hmm. business and uh, civil engineering at Kansas University. And uh, because in the Midwest you can't be a actor, I mean, you have to be a lawyer or somebody. And uh, so I did that, but I'd been acting since I was like in the sixth grade. And I realized that <clears throat> I have to kind of follow my dream or you know, life could kind of go on by. So I practiced uh, with this firm, Cornhusker Paving Company in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> uh, putting in uh, concrete rows and RC, uh, reinforced concrete pipe. Uh, and I lasted for uh, six months. And I got on a plane, or I mean on a bus, with $1,500 in my pocket and went to New York to try this craft that I enjoy. And uh, a wise old man once told me, <clears throat> he said, he said, give it a time period. You know, in other words, if you're gonna do something, it's not for the rest of your life, uh, which kind of scares us all of, oh my God, I gotta make a decision because this is, no, do it for a year, two, whatever it is. And you might want to try to do something else. I might want to be a writer or work for an advertising. So I gave it three years to see if I could uh, uh, establish this craft and make a living at it. And, and I was ready to look elsewhere and do other things, but not really. <laughs> and so um, success came in New York. I won some awards in theater and uh, and Broadway and stuff and then and moved on to there. So that's kind of the journey uh, path that uh, my life took at that early age. Now you, tr you trained at the world famous actor studio mm -hmm. in East Strasburg. What was that experience like? For Stunning. You? Uh, if, if you don't know it's called the, the, uh, the actor studio with Lee Strasberg and he obviously is a guru of acting teachers that we've had, uh, you know, uh, in our country. <clears throat> and he brought this Stanislavski method back, which is just a, it's a fancy name, fancy term, uh, for just being real, is really what it is. And so I always, um, I knew that I had to study the craft if I wanted to be good at it and understand it. And, and I found that uh, this is the avenue that I wanted to take. I wanted to study with this man. And so I had the opportunity to study with him personally at the actor's studio, doing many, many scenes with him uh, for five years. <clears throat> and a lot of people don't realize, but the actor's studio just isn't, you know, serious stuff. You know, acting is acting. It's comedy, too. Your timing in comedy and stuff like this. And, not, and I don't mean shtick comedy. I mean situational comedy. Your Peter Sellers, uh, uh, Charlie Chaplin type of comedy, and so this is so you can make everything real, whether it's serious drama or comedy, and so I, I felt kind of lucky because I could do both, so that way I could work more than anybody else because I could you know I could do be fun, I could be funny and I could do serious stuff, so that's the journey of the actor's studio, which would meant a great deal to me to be able to to. Uh, uh, be associated with this man. Now, as you were going through the actor's studio, you primarily early in your career did a lot of television, correct? Mm -hmm. At what point were you trying to make a jump to do features and that kind of stuff? <clears throat> I don't think there's a jump. Uh, you know, if you're not a movie star and you're a character actor, you take what comes along. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and I've been very fortunate that, um, you know, one job would lead to the other. Uh, so what does that say? Okay, you, you did okay in your last job, so the people now in the next job, you're, you're okay, we'll get this guy. 
because it, a lot of actors, and I, I think uh, all of us in life, uh, don't realize that whatever job you're pursuing or whatever position you're going for, that they want you, they, they're hoping that you're the right one because they've got a thousand other decisions to make. And I, and I realize that in acting, they say, oh, please, God, make this guy to be the right one so we, so we don't have to worry about this anymore and we can deal with the, the editing process or the getting the locations or whatever it is. And so once I had that attitude in my head, uh, the jobs came you know, pretty easy um, along that avenue. <laughs> Now, since this is primarily a horror convention, I feel like I'm gonna we're gonna talk about a lot of your films over your career. So I figure we'll just start with a couple of horror movies you're in. Yeah. And you're in one of my favorite little anthology movies, from a whisper to oh, a my, scream. My. <clears throat> yeah. I, that was kind of like the first horror movie type of. I mean, I, I remember way back when that was done, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> a wonderful little production, and uh, that kind of got me introduced to horror because I wasn't. You know, like a horror fan. I'm an acting fan. I'm a craft fan. Uh, so horror, comedy, whatever, whatever came along. So that was one of the avenues that that happened. And obviously, Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven, which is funny because when the script was offered to me, I said, "It's what? It's Part Seven? <laughs> 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 Part seven, <laughs> and I said, uh, "No, read the script, Terry, because I just, just read." The, I said, "All right," and so I read the script, and what and what, uh, what fascinated me, why I, why I really took the part is because I I thought, well, Jason is the bad guy in Friday the Thirteenth movies, and all of a sudden, here was a character, Doctor Cruz. Bad News Cruz, <laughs> who's a bad guy too, and that that just fascinated me, and I, and that's the reason that I that I took the part, uh, because I said I had the opportunity to play a bad guy, outside of Jason, and I I, I don't know if this was the only bad guy in all the series or something like that, but I mean it was probably pretty close, uh, so yeah that's how that came about that horror whole genre, and then. Uh, What's this, what's this latest one that uh, just all of a sudden hit that we did many years ago with Denise, Ru uh, Denise Richards? Are you talking about Tammy and the T-Rex? Yeah, cheapers, yeah. creepers, where did that come from? Well, uh, funny enough, I work, at a, I work for a repertory like cinema place and we did an early screening because someone found the gore cut of it in a dumpster and they saved it and now it's at the Academy in the archive. And that was basically what we had used for that Blu-ray. So you worked with Stuart Raffle on a couple projects as well. Sure. But I do have to ask about Tammy and T-Rex because it is a very <laughs> unique movie. Um, I asked John Goff, who was also in it, and he had Buck Flower and had a bunch of other people. But what was going on in that movie? What was going on in that movie? Yeah. I, re I remember Stu Stuart Raffle. <laughs> You know, he somebody offered him, a, you know, a dinosaur or whatever the hell the T-Rex thing, and uh, said, "Make a movie." So he said, so "Okay, I'll make a movie." And so this, you know, we, it opened and lay dormant for many years. And a year ago, obviously, they re-edited the thing and put it back. But I remember going on the set, and uh, the director Stewart said, "Terry, come and look through the lens of this camera. I want to show you something." And they were setting up a shot with Denise Richards, and this was her first movie. This was a thing like this. And she was, you know, a puppy. I don't, you know, 17, 18, I don't know. And, uh, and he says, and he says, this is the most beautiful face I've seen on film in many years. So I looked at her, yeah, okay. <laughs> she, she looks all right, this is good. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I remember, I remember him saying that, uh, being, uh, you know, that she was so gorgeous on film and things like that. And then we did the thing and it was, you know, we had we had fun doing it. Uh, you know, uh, what was it? Doctor Spritzenfield or some whatever his name was. <laughs> thing like this. And even when I'm signing things, I always have a little cheat sheet because I don't know how to spell Doctor Spritzenfield or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> thing like this. What's your character's name? I, just a second. Oh, there it is, Doctor Spritzenfield. Uh, so yeah, that 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 thing came out of the blue. Uh, we're doing another Friday the Thirteenth. It's finished. Called Roseblood. Uh, that's one of these fan things, 
and uh, I mean they put a lot of money in this thing and they flew, well, they, well we, they flew me up here to, 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 uh, to do the thing what my character Dr. Cruz and the girl that he's making crazy it's a flashback um, in the insane asylum where he's making her crazy and saying you'll never get out of here and everything and everything and everything whatever and uh, she ah, screams, and I ran to the for that, and bam, boom, then the movie starts. <laughs> so, you know, it's like a flashback where at the beginning of the movie, and then the movie takes off. And I guess comes, was it, I, I think they're the end of November, they're flying me in some, I think New Hampshire or some places. And um, uh, then you can see it on YouTube, I guess. I guess that's a trip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, see it on YouTube. And, uh, and then I'm just uh, have a beautiful new film with the, and, and it's it's horror too, but it's very Jonathan Peel type of horror. But, uh, 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 they're uh, they were starting uh, I think September 17th, something like that. Uh, it's a, a, a new one that I can't remember the title right now, but it's got a lot of dialogue. <laughs> I said, I think I need a little more money for that. Okay, okay, that's okay, good. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so that should be fun. So that's I think that's the genre of my horror experiences. You know, I've had a couple in my personal life, but besides that, it's all right. Now, since we were already talking about Stewart, you also did Mannequin on the Moon with him. Yeah. Which... I'm probably alone in this opinion is the superior sequel to the original, which, what was your thoughts of like having to do like a sequel to a big movie that was completely opposite of how the original was? Well, it's interesting. This character was named Count Spritzel. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> Spritzel. And uh, for some reason I had a long, you know, you know growing hair that came down about you know, this long. <laughs> I don't know why I put it in there. But that movie came about because uh, we just got the, the go-ahead for the Bernie 2 movie. And uh, they, they were really over a barrel because you don't get you know, that, that often, again, as I say, as a character actor, to all of a sudden say, stick them up. <laughs> <laughs> And all of a sudden, the second burning, uh, we got the money for the second one, and uh, stick them up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I think that was kind of a because they paid me, a, you know, a, a lot of money for the for the for the Switzerland thing, mm -hmm. uh, but it was kind of because they were going to pay me for the new burning. So it was kind of like a you know they were doubling up on it. It was like a package kind of thing. Yeah, kind of thing. Now, since you brought it up, let's talk a little bit about Weekend and Birdies. How did that come about? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, <laughs> yeah Zeus. That came about. Uh, they called me in LA and they said, Terry, we want you to audition for this, this, this film because it's, uh, we think you're right for the thing, really, really right for it. And I had just been in a, a Kind of a minor motorcycle accident and I had like seven stitches in my head and then they had to shave you know how you shave you have to shave before you put stitches in so like you know so something something in here was shaved or so, I, I don't know and I said I can't go in I got a shaved head I can we think you're right I said I, I got my head is you know I, 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 it's like it's shaved here I can't I can't do that okay so a month goes by this grows out and this grows out and I'm just kind of hanging out, reading, and having good fun. And they call again. They said, the, the producer and the director and the writer, they're in New York trying to cast. They can't cast it, Terry. They don't know what to do with a thing like that. Uh, I, can you please come in? I don't know. Okay, 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 <laughs> okay. And so I'm, I'm literally shaving myself. I'm uh, looking at the thing, and... I never had a mustache in my life. And I was going, on, oh, I left the mustache. To this day, I think the mustache got the job. <laughs> <laughs> but for real. And uh, so I left the mustache. <clears throat> and I went in there and they, uh, 
what do you, what, what, what do you, what do you want to do, Terry? And I said, well, there's, I'll just do something, and then if you, you know, need something different, let me know. And so I said, you know, we'll just see what. <clears throat> same, same, same. I said, no, that's perfect. I said, I said, do you need anything else? No, 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 that's per you're just perfect. Perfect. I said, okay, good, good. So I get back home, they fly the, the, uh, send the tape, or however they got it, to New York, to the director, producer, and writer. <clears throat> and I get a phone call back and said, you got it. They want you. They they want you. They they want you. And, I, and I'm saying the mustache guy. <laughs> <laughs> and because because I don't know. You know how you have instincts about you know uh, things in life and stuff like that. But I but I mean I saw these two young guys, these you know the little young guys, and then me in between. And so you know it was kind of the mustache could kind of you know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But but that's and uh, and then I was afraid to go in and meet the director when they came back from New York. I didn't want to meet anybody. Just I'll just show up at the set. You know, and the thing like that because I thought you know they'll see me and they go, mm, no, 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 no. I, mean, I think no, not yet. And uh, well, obviously, that didn't happen. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> and we went on to to make this movie, and I kind of thought it was like a you know one trick pony type of thing uh, at first. And we went to New York and. We're in one of the dance studios, like seventh floor is up, and we were re rehearsing the thing, like a play, and thing, and thing. Okay, uh, let's tie shoelaces, winch, okay, a thing like that. And I literally, the producer was a Frenchman, and he had on the Bernie glasses. <laughs> and I'm looking for this part, and I'm, get, let, me, let me just, let me, here, give me those, because that thing. <laughs> That's how the Bernie Glasses came about, off of him during rehearsal in a New York seventh floor thing that we we're doing stuff. And uh, and then we're tying shoes and we said we laugh and start laughing, we're floating on boards back and forth and the thing. Was, and uh, the three of us kind of looked at each other and said, you know, this could be funny. This could, this could be funny. And we rehearsed and then started putting in stuff. And the first time that I saw myself on film during the dailies, mm -hmm. dead. Mm -hmm. I said, he's, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but, it, but it's, he's dead dead, it's not funny dead. He's just dead. Right. And I went, holy crap. So, so I go back to my suite and I go, jeepers. Uh, it's 12, one o'clock in the morning, I'm in front of a mirror saying, how can you be Funny dead. He's, you know, he's dead. He's just dead. And uh, and I guess we, we all go back to whatever we're you know our basic one on one acting or whatever we're you know biology whatever we're in. Uh, so let's just let's start over here. <clears throat> and what is he trying to do? Well, he's trying to goof on these guys. What he's trying to do? The whole idea, Bernie, and uh, to me. And uh, and I'm in the mirror trying. And I know that whatever happens. He's gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold it for two minutes, whatever, you know, what, whatever happens, you know, it's a thing like this. And I, but that's where that Bernie smirk came from. That would you, <laughs> <laughs> and I used it, and we saw the dailies, and I saw the old timers, the, the, the crew. You know, if you can, I always go, <laughs> I always go to them. You know, <laughs> I don't go to the director or the thing like, yeah, you, you were good and things like this. I watch the crew because they've seen everything and they could give less of a yeah. crap about it. You know, in other words, they just get, they, but they left. And I said, I got it. Now he's not dead dead, he's funny dead. And that was a big transition in that movie right then. But, Fun. What was it like working with Ted Kotcha? Because he's a maniac. He's, well, obviously, he's, he he did movies like Wake and Fright, sure. First Blood, and like he had a pretty insane career. Yeah, total maniac, <laughs> uh, and a joy to work with, uh, because you know he was very flamboyant and intellectual, and could talk food and things and theater and violins and so you know, uh, so that was always fun. But he get on the set, and if he and if he he could he could get crazy, <laughs> and but he would never obviously do it to me, you know, as an actor. He'd take it out on 
you know, you know, somebody working the cable or something like that. Let <laughs> for the Whoa, 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 whoa! And I'd say, I'll be in the dressing room. I'll be right back. <laughs> I would just leave anything like that. But he was a, such a creative man, and so you, you know, all of a sudden that that walkie-talkie would be in the ocean, you know. And, uh, and, uh, 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 but uh, but he was very creative and, and uh, you know always looking for new things. So yeah, ta talented man. Man. What was it like working with everyone in the cast and crew? Because it has a wonderful cast, including yourself, and like they all have to play off of you because you're the focal point of the movie. Like, did you have to like figure out different ways to make sure it all just worked together when you're doing your scenes? Yeah. I, th I think a transition happened. It was called Hot and Cold, the movie, when it, when it started. <laughs> and uh, uh, about a quarter of the way through it, I went to the producer and the writer and said, uh, Bernie's becoming a bigger focus than you guys thought, right? And I said, yeah, Jesus, Terry, I don't know how that happened. I said, I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you should change the title. And that's how Weekend at Bernie's came about. You know, we said, hmm, wait a minute, this movie is turning around here. It's about this guy now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, so uh, that's how that turned about. And, uh, uh, success. What was it like for that movie because it became a huge hit like it's I did you kind of know there was like like lightning in the bottle with it as you were making it or was it just as I said as I said during during rehearsals and stuff and then we start putting stuff down and we heard dailies and laughing and stuff like this we said uh, you know this could be this could be this would be good but we all know that when you start editing a movie and stuff like things change things that you know that's that, that's takes another direction. So the other thing, and I remember going in uh, LA out, out in Pasadena or someplace mm -hmm. for a, a, a screening, for the first screening of the thing like that. And so they had like a 10 o'clock screening or something like this and they had young kids, uh, you know, college kids or younger, young kids. And we, we sat in the back and got like this. And all of a sudden the movie started and stuff like this. And I started laughing, <laughs> and then roaring, and then laugh roaring, and we just looked at each other and said, "Let's sit back. We're going to get a ride. This ride is happening." <laughs> and uh, and you don't get that opportunity that much in life, you know, to really have something ba boom like that thing did. And uh, but it was, you know, total joy, total joy. Now, when Weekend at Bernie's 2 came up, what was your first thought of that, when that came along? Because, obviously, you're dead. Well, I wanted to go someplace where I could take off my shoes and socks, <laughs> and the water would be warm. <laughs> and because I got a call from the, for the producer on Sunday. Terry, come over to the, get over to the house right now. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, so I go over to his house, and, and, the, and the writer's there, and the three of us are there. Uh, sit down. He opens up champagne. He says, we got money for the second movie. <laughs> wow, wow. What do you want, what do you want to do, Terry? What, how, what should we do? What do you, what do you, warm, warm. Has <laughs> 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 to be a place where it's warm. <laughs> and that's really how, you know, the, the islands of, you know, St. Croix, that's, that's how that came about. <laughs> Just in that, you know, first giggly thing, drinking champagne on a Sunday morning. Uh, is how the direction went as far as uh, uh, do warmth, do good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's how it happened. So how is the approach to doing Bernie this time different than the previous one? Because there, obviously, there, I, I'm sure there was a fear of becoming too one trick, but <clears throat> did you have any like collaborative like, way of figuring out how to make new kinks and being able to do it? Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the big thing was, uh, you know, the Bernie dance. Uh, <laughs> uh, which, which yeah, I mean, we all we all know that you know, like ten years ago, all of a sudden the, the whole thing, everybody, all the discos and things, and Bernie, everybody doing the Bernie dance and stuff like that. And again, I don't do shtick comedy. My all my comedy is based based out of situations, so it has to be real to me, to make to to, to make it work for, for, for the actor. 
<clears throat> and they said, okay, now you're going to be sitting on the toilet and the music starts, and what you're going to do is you're going to start moving because the, mu the music moves you and it wakes you in the thing and, they send, and you get up and then you walk. Well, music plays and I'm sitting on the toilet. Okay. <laughs> uh, my whole life, then you go back again to like the beginning of acting, 101. What music, what, 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 how can I make this real so it's not sticky and real and stuff like that? Well, we all know music starts here. That, that's, that's where music in the body and music and everything starts here. I said, all right, so <clears throat> right. And so this is, that mu music started, and I, I just put everything, and so that's where, <laughs> and that's where, <laughs> that's, that's where, <laughs> and, and that's, that's where, that's, where it started, but we laugh at that. But as a craftsman, you're doing something that's real. It's, it's not shtick. It's something that that you identify with because something is real. Something is happening. And so I made all that music, you know, come out, come out, come out, come out there, come out there, come, come out where it did. And uh, you know that took a life into itself. Uh, just the musical aspect and Bernie moving around like that. Uh, the second one was, was fun because um, uh, you get to the point, I, I broke three ribs during the movie. I, I, I had a vertebrae jammed in my neck causing violent dizziness and you know, thing like this. So because what we found out in the Bernies, if you get, if you get shot, if I get shot, I call, well, look, look at me catch myself, see? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I can do that. And when you're dead, <laughs> you're that. So people got hurt because nobody's done it before. Nobody had done, you know, did this crazy stuff. And uh, once we got past that, and I woke up to the point that, well, then it's all right, Terry, just get in the wagon and we're going to bounce your head in the thing. We're put you along like that. I said, I'm sorry, I don't. Quite understand what you're saying. Could you show me? Just, you know, just, just show me, and then uh, then if you show me, then I can probably do it. But you're going to have to show me first. Once I made that decision, I was saying, because of it, did we get the shot? We get the, how's the actor? You know, we're always second fiddle on the thing. And once I established that, you know, you do it, and then show me how to do it, and then I'll do it. It started getting a little more safe on the set, but people got hurt because it was something new of falling and stuff. When they went off the balcony, that was a double. But again, when you go off a balcony, you can push yourself and hit the mat. When you're dead, you go like this. So he just went like this and scraped his whole 27 stitches in his face that went straight down like that, uh, which was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing I learned, I, I, there's a a great lesson that I learned um, that I, I can pass on to you as artists, whatever whatever your profession is or something like this, but uh, uh, I, 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 Paul Newman, uh, I was cast in the first movie that he directed called Rachel, Rachel. And uh, I played an evangelist minister that talked in tongues. And uh, Newman, Paul liked to, uh, liked to rehearse it like a play first, because he's from the theater. And this is his first directorial thing. And then we would shoot it. And so I had this scene with Joanne, and, and I was, oh Lord, can we hit? And I was, I mean, I was healing her. And she was scared to death. What was going on? We can save this woman right here, and the Lord talked to me. And, and what happened was, somehow, she was fighting, and I was holding on to her, and we ended up under the table. Lord, we have her now. Cut it right, right. Hold it. 
but most people would say, well, you know, that was that was good, but we have to we have to do it up here. So like that. Paul Newman was under the table, saying with the DP, saying, now can we get this shot here? Is there any way we can? And why I I pass this story on, because as artists, we must not be frightened about going under the table. Because that's where things happen. Something real happened on that set. It wasn't fake, something happened with Joanne and I, and that thing, and Paul being the artist that he is, had the DP, director of photography, how can we get this shot? And I pass that on because we all have our ideas and stuff like this, and sometimes we get you know, a little tunnel vision as far as how we're creating or, or seeing stuff. And so somebody comes in from the outside and you have a tendency to say, well, no, no, wait, just a second, I'm, I, ha I have my, don't be afraid to get under the table with your ideas and thoughts, you know, uh, as you move through your artistic direction, whatever it may be, uh, from hair to makeup to acting to writing to whatever it is. But you have to be open because those moments are what makes things alive and makes things real because something is happening. And don't cut that off because it's not, it, because it's not where you think it should be and that's on top. Get under the table. At least be open to those things. So I share that, that thought because it meant a great deal to me as far as uh, uh, moving on. In, in my life, in my career, and, and, and ideas that I come up with all of a sudden. Now, speaking of that, that story, you actually did your own acting school for a bit, didn't mm. you? I did. I had uh, met a lo lovely lady on a set in Texas, and, and I have a little ranch up in Colorado. And she come on up and she was and she, we were together for a week, and then she goes to the airport, we're both crying, all together, and she can't stay together. Uh, I don't know. Well, Austin, Texas seems like a very open-minded city, and I'm in Dallas, and we maybe so that's the only way we can figure out how to stay together for a little bit. And uh, so I moved to Austin, and I was like, what the hell am I supposed to do up here? I was, I was commuting to Nashville doing a series, so that was one thing, but I said, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to spend my time. She said, well, why don't you start a studio? You know, and we're passed on some of your knowledge from Strasburg. And it was one of the best things I ever made, the decisions. And, uh, and so I, we did a, a seminar, a thing like that, and uh, you know, we thought you know, 30 people would show up or something like that, and I guess there were like 300 of them. Uh, and uh, signed up and we were sold out for two years um, doing the thing. And I even opened it up because I wanted to do children too. I wanted to, I wanted to do little kids because uh, you know, there's such a delicate commodity at that age as far as their minds and stuff like this. And, and I wanted the opportunity to work with them of not being able to, uh, of being able to let them grow with ideas and stuff like that. It meant a lot to me. Uh, and, 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 it was, and it was successful too, you know. It's, it was just a wonderful, nice feeling for me to have. As, as an artist passing something on. So yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, uh, very successful. Uh, lady friend, her mother got Alzheimer's in Dallas. I gotta take care of her, Terry, gotta get it. She says, so, uh, Jesus, from now here I'm in, you know, awesome. She said, what the hell am I doing here? And I said, I gotta get back to my ranch. I gotta go back to my ranch. And so, made that decision of, stopping the studio and going back to the ranch and going from there, yeah. Now, I just, <laughs> if you're okay with this, I want to kind of ask you about, because you have such a career and you've been in all kinds of movies. I, I picked a few from your filmography. And yeah. Just random ones. I know you're not really in this one much, but you were in uh, An Eye for an Eye with Chuck Norris. Wow. That was his first movie. That was his first movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had, uh, I met them uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, they wanted they uh, some part of Charlie or something something, and so I, I started guesting on in a show all the time, mm -hmm. and I ended up doing like three or four movies with Chuck, but but I also like just was like a regular guest star on there, on the on the series thing, and uh, 
It was for an Iron Eye, this movie. It was Chuck's first movie, and it was his brother Aaron's first direct, uh, he, was, he was stunt coordinator. And, uh, and so we shot it in San Francisco, and the whole idea was that I'm in the first third of the movie and then I die, because the bad guys kill me. And the rest two thirds of the movie is Chuck hunting the bad guys that got his partner. That's that movie. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've talked about Tammy and T Rex. You were in another very strange cult movie called Surf Two. Oh my, my, yeah. I don't remember one thing about that. Movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a funny thing. A funny thing. I was working with Carol Burnett, and, and bless her heart. Uh, not, obviously, we all know what an iconic woman this is. <laughs> Jesus Christ, and. For me, look at uh, to have the opportunity to work, work with this lady uh, was a blessing, and I worked for for, for a year and a half. Another wonderful lesson to pass on. Uh, you know, when you reach my age, you say, well, "What do you got left?" I said, "Okay, but I'm gonna pass on things." You know? <laughs> uh, uh, we were rehearsing one thing, and I and I, and I got to her and I. I said, Car in a, a sketch or something, and I don't know, maybe, maybe you know, Carol, maybe I should, you know, I, I could, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, have sideburns here or something in an accent, and, and uh, you know, what I got, Terry, stand up! <laughs> now do it! <laughs> do it! In other words, what she was saying is, stop this, stop this. Just do something, do something, <laughs> something will happen. Something will happen. Oh. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know what'll happen. But what she was saying is, stop the chatter. Stop the chatter and do it. Do something. Because something will happen. Have the have the faith of your creative craft that something will happen. And I think in, in all of our life, you know, we come across things like this that we are going to intellectualize and talk about things and what it is. No. Shut this off and do it. Do something. Do something. Pick up that pencil. Do, you know, I'm going to write something and what I think I'm going to... Pick up the pencil! <laughs> do it! And so, <laughs> okay, you know. Uh, uh, I pass that on because it meant so much for, to me. And I mean, this woman uh, was such a, I mean, we did so many wonderful things together. Played a 94 year old couple in an old people's home with this makeup and, 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 and eating jello, trying to turn each other on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, things that, that you just, that are so special to you. Uh, when you look back on your life and what's come down, uh, you know she was she was she was quite a, quite a woman, quite a gal, quite a gal. Now, what are some of your personal favorite roles that you've had over the years that may, might be under the radar for a lot of people here? I, I say it without being facetious or anything else, but you know every every role I have, I have fun with, and I don't care what it is. Uh, I mean, because I love the craft so much, you know, I have trouble, you know, hammering things and different things, and like, but the craft itself uh, is, is like a special thing to me, and, I, and I'm good at it, and thank God. Uh, th there was a wonderful part, I did a four-part four part episode of Hill Street Blues, and I played a character by the name of Vic Hitler. And he was a narcoleptic comic that kept falling asleep during his comedy act. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful part and stuff like this. And uh, I, I remember two things. In, I, said, I said, Jesus Christ. I'm reading the script and I, and I have one of my friends who's a stand-up stand comic and I said, gee, I, I got to I gotta stand up in, in front of this audience, and then I, I'm not funny. I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not. I don't. I, I'm, I'm not, I, can't, I can't do this. And he said, "Let me give me the script." 
Well, look, look what it says. Here, Terry. It says, the audience laughs. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All of a sudden, that freed me some way. You know what I mean? That I didn't have to be funny, I didn't have to do anything, because the audience has to laugh, because it says so much. <laughs> uh, again, of trying to do something real as an actor, what did I do? Uh, narcoleptic comic that fell asleep during his comedy act. Uh, and I'm going, how do you do that? How do you do that to make it look real and not sticky or anything? How do I do that to make that look real? And what I did, what I found, I, I found lights. And, uh, and I would do it, and I would do it, hey, we're gonna have it. And I, and, and, and I let the lights put me to sleep. And what I mean by that is, I, I'd be like this, and. <laughs> but it worked. And it was real. He looked and said, this guy just fell asleep. <laughs> Doing a stand-up comedy. And it was, it was wonderful how, 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 do, how do actors, um, find their character, and you know, I always look for the vulnerability in a, in a person, because we're all vulnerable. It doesn't have to be ha 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 vulnerable, it can be just a vulnerable, the laugh, whatever, the smile for the audience. And there was a, a thing on the thing, this cop comes up to me and he says, you're a stand-up comic? Said, yeah. And your name is Vic Hitler? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you ever think of, you know, like changing your name? And I just looked at him and went, why? The vulnerability of well, the character was right there, that one, one, one line for me. Why? It's my name. My name. So it's amazing where you can find things as writers, as craftsmen, whatever we do, and the little things, you know, you know just bend the page a little bit and turn it and it might just be right on the back of that. You never know. You never you never know. You never know where that creative stuff comes from. It's fun. Uh, you did a lot of TV and you were on two pretty iconic <coughs> TV shows in the 80s, 90s. Uh, one was Murder, She Wrote, where you played two different roles. Wow. Wow, I did? Yeah. You're one of the few. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the rare company of people that were on the show more than once that played different roles. Oh, well. Uh, obviously, she, she she was a legend, and uh, I, I was, as I said, very lucky. I, I don't I don't I don't remember playing those two roles and stuff. But I did like I did like 150 different you know things uh, throughout my career. Uh, so, and it's funny if somebody pops me, say, oh, <laughs> you 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 were in the uh, Kalali show, right? <laughs> and I would always say. Yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> because, because what happens is, if you say, you were in the Kalali show, right? I said, Kalali? No, I wasn't in it. Oh, the Mubo show, huh? No, that wasn't it. Oh, the Kalali was snatch, no. In other words, all of a sudden you're talking about yourself in a conversation that you have no want to be here any more than the man on the moon. <laughs> so anybody that says, you were in that show, weren't you? I said, yep, I sure was. <laughs> sure was. It stops, it stops the chatter a little bit. <laughs> what is the, outside of Bernie, what is the role where people recognize you the most and come up to you and say anything about? I got Dr. Cruz, Bad News Cruz. You know, that, that, was, uh, that was a big one. Um, I, did a, I did some episodes of uh, Three's Company <clears throat> that turned out, I guess starred like two years in a row, and it turned out that that, that show was the best show of that year and the best show of that year, hmm. the, the two of them, uh, like that. Uh, and so a lot of people kind of remember that. But I think it's, it's just mostly just the face. I mean, they just, you know, Ladies have come up to me. Do we know each other? <laughs> <laughs> because you're in everybody's bedroom. 
You know what I mean? A lot of TV. A lot of TV. Are you sure? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so, so I mean, you get you get popped for you know I get popped for a lot of things, but it, it's mostly you know. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> I you get that. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. You get that a lot. Uh, but yeah, I mean, do, do you get tired of that, Terry? No, I do not. No, I accept that graciously uh, because it shows a recognition of your craft. That's why these shows here, uh, you know, I, I didn't do them for a long, long time. And I just, uh, you know, just kind of started last year. But I, I see you, it, it, it humbles you because you're, you see that something that you love to do that you do for free, if you could, you know, buy a sandwich and, uh, uh, but you do for free, and you're getting paid to do it, and you see that you're you're making an impression on people's lives. You know, you're, you're, you've done something that has moved somebody to either tears or laughter, or some type of emotion in themselves. Uh, it's interesting. I just um, I just uh, directed a little film, um, and it's a 25 minute film, but it's for the uh, the uh, the uh, festival circuits, uh, these short films like this, called The Journey. And the whole idea I wanted for this film was this last line that's made such an impression on me, wake up or stay dead. That's life. Wake up. You're going to try new things, you're going to try to create, you're going to move past where you are now, look look in the future, look ahead. You're going to be dead, you're just going to be stay where you are and turn into a vegetable or not, or not try new things or, or, or just let it go. And so uh, this one wonderful little crazy character with, you know, long hair and kind of Santa Claus-ish guy that lives in a cave. Wake up or stay dead. Yeah. <laughs> because that's life. <laughs> and I hope that leaves an impression on people. You know, that, uh, oh, okay, Martha, I get that. Okay, wake up or stay dead. I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I hope, you know, <coughs> I always say I hope Patoka, Illinois can hear it. Uh, because uh, those are the people that, that watch our films you know, out there. And yeah, but they don't know anything, Terry. They know a lot. Patoka, Illinois knows a lot. Because they're, they're your audience. So, you know, get that out there. Wake up or stay dead. And then if you're an intellect and you want to dance on that a little bit, Go ahead and dance, whatever you did. But the main, the Patoka, Illinois thing is you, are you going to try things? Are you going to try to grow in your life? Are you going to try to look beyond where you are now? Or are you going to stay dead? You're just going to just stay there and not try new things and move, not move on uh, with thoughts. We'll see. Terry, it's been an absolute yeah, pleasure well, being here. Thank you. 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 Thank